Welcome to my first podcast looking to help with the ANSCA Part 2. I'm Aaron and I'm currently working as a Provisional Fellow in Gibraltar. The idea behind these podcasts is to look at investigations in the context of how they will be presented to you in the viva and the medical viva. The reason for looking closely at investigations is that this has been consistently identified as a weakness for candidates in all parts of the exam. This will work by a STEM being presented within an investigation like the exam, so I would encourage you to pause the video and do your own interpretation before continuing. As a disclaimer, these podcasts are based on my own experience from the exam and reference articles. They are in no way affiliated with ANSCA. The aims are to recreate a viva scenario for practicing ECG interpretation, suggesting an approach to efficiently look at investigations, suggesting an approach for decision making about whether to proceed with surgery, as well as giving you practical information for managing a certain condition that will be revealed later. So the STEM is a 23-year-old female presenting for abdominal plasty on the day of surgery in a private hospital. She has the background of opioid abuse on methadone 50 mg daily. She is otherwise fit and well with a good exercise tolerance. Please interpret this ECG. Pause now for your own interpretation. This is my approach to looking at an investigation, and remember you can always fall back on your structured method of rate, rhythm, axis, etc. if you don't see anything obvious. What I'm looking for. This focuses you on what is particularly relevant on this ECG for this patient. It should be a short sentence. What the abnormality is. How severe it is. What this means for the patient. Asking for more detail at the end allows the examiner to let you relook at the investigation if you miss something important. This approach is based on my discussion with examiners who say that candidates often take too long to get to the point and don't consider how the investigation is relevant in this particular patient. So in the above patient I'm looking for a prolonged QT as methadone is associated with this. This ECG shows markedly prolonged QT of 520 milliseconds and I would calculate a QTC to quantify severity. This patient has a potentially life-threatening change that could cause torsodes de pons under anesthesia. I would like to take further history and exam before proceeding. Would you like me to look at the ECG in more detail? The idea behind this approach is it focuses you on the likely problem and shows your consultant level knowledge. It also is much more efficient than doing a structured approach of rate, rhythm, axis, etc. It allows you to move on more quickly. In this example, I have answered more detail than the question, which is good as it shows you know the importance of the finding, but bad as it wastes time if it's not included on the marking scan. You can stop after interpretation of severity and wait for further questions if you prefer. So for follow-up questions, how do you calculate QTC? What is normal QTC? Why do we calculate QTC? Why is this abnormality important? Pause here to consider your own answers. I would calculate the QTC using the MedCalc app. I believe the formula is QT divided by the square root of RR interval in seconds. A QTC above 470 milliseconds in males and 480 milliseconds in females is abnormal. The QTC in this case is markedly prolonged at 562 milliseconds. We do this calculation as QT interval decreases as heart rate increases. It is important as a long QTC increases risk of R on T phenomena causing torsades de point, a polymorphic ventricular tachycardia that can lead to cardiac arrest and death. Anesthesia is high risk for these patients. What further information would you want? Pause now for your own answer. Please interpret this ECG. Pause now for your own interpretation. The patient has no syncope or family history of sudden cardiac death. ECG monitoring has been done six months ago with a slightly prolonged QTC of 480 milliseconds and the patient has been suspected of selling her methadone to other patients. Addiction specialist advises dose should be tapered and will see her in clinic this week. Are you happy to proceed? Pause now for your own answer. So in the above patient I'm looking for a prolonged QT as methadone is associated with this. This ECG shows markedly prolonged QT of 520 milliseconds and I would calculate a QTC to quantify severity. 
This patient has a potentially life-threatening change that could cause torsades de pons under anesthesia. I would like to take further history and exam before proceeding. Would you like me to look at the ECG in more detail? The idea behind this approach is it focuses you on the likely problem and shows your consultant level knowledge. It also is much more efficient than doing a structured approach of rate, rhythm, axis, etc. It allows you to move on more quickly. In this example, I have answered more detail than the question, which is good as it shows you know the importance of the finding, but bad as it wastes time. You see the patient two weeks later while working in a tertiary hospital where she has come in septic with CT diagnosed perforated appendicitis. Her QTC is now 550 milliseconds after tapering methadone. How would you proceed? Pause now for your answer. The decision making technique about whether to proceed now is the same, but the change is obviously prolonged deferment is not safe in a septic patient with perforated appendicitis. I would use the pre op, inter op, and post op structure. Things I remember for long QTC are avoiding things that prolong QT and promote torsades, prevention of increased SNS simulation, which can cause torsades, and detection and management of torsades if it occurs. So I'd say this is an urgent case with limited time for optimization in a high risk patient. Preoperatively, I would avoid anything that prolongs QT by ensuring potassium is greater than 4.5 and magnesium and calcium were normal and stopping QT prolonging drugs where possible. I would avoid excess sympathetic stimulation by ensuring good pain relief and giving midazolam if anxious. Intraoperatively, my goals would be to avoid drugs which prolong QT, prevent increased sympathetic stimulation, be able to quickly diagnose and treat torsades if it occurs, as well as having a septic patient with an acute abdomen. You can talk about the anaesthetic either via goals or chronologically, whichever you find easier. So I'd have the defib in the room and pads on. I would insert arterial line to have mechanical capture of the heart. I would gain large bore IV access, which may be difficult from previous drug use. I would have two grams of magnesium prepared. I would do a modified RSI with rock curonium, avoiding succinamethonium. I would use really fentanyl to obtain sympathetic response to laryngoscopy and surgery. I would use fluorine maintenance as although it prolongs QTC, it is not torsadogenic. I would use a bear hugger and temperature monitoring to avoid hypothermia, which prolongs QT. I would have heart rate goals of 60 to 100. I would closely monitor for, for, for ventricular arrhythmias. I would avoid hypercarbia and use of ketamine. I would load with two 10 to 20 milligrams of morphine at the end of the case if the patient is opioid tolerant. I would use Sigamlex to prevent prolonged QT from neostigmine reversal. Postoperatively, I would avoid prolonging QT by ensuring potassium, magnesium and calcium were normal and avoid QT prolonging drugs. I would avoid increased SNS simulation by good pain relief post-op with a PCA morphine with increased bolus dose of 2 mg. In terms of detection and management, I'd have telemetry for 24 hours, have cardiology to review the patient and also the acute pain service for difficult pain management and to consider conversion of methadone to another opiate. During the anesthetic, you look up and see this monitor screen. What do you do? Pause now for your answer. I would confirm there is a pulse and commence CPR if pulseless. Stop surgical stimulus and have defib connected and switch on. If not resolved at this point, I would give a DC cardioversion starting 100 joules. I would then give magnesium 2 grams IV over 2 minutes. Magnesium is highly effective at preventing recurrent arrhythmias. If refractory, I can give a further bolus of magnesium after 15 minutes and then start an infusion at 3 to 20 milligrams per minute. If refractory, overdrive pacing is highly effective at preventing recurrence. I would be prepared to start CPR if pulses and I would avoid amiodarone in this case. Thanks for listening to the Viva. The rest will give a bit more information about the complicated topic of long QT syndromes that often comes up in Vivas. Congenital long QT syndromes are high risk and require specialist cardiology care. They present as syncope palpitations or pseudo seizures, often brought about by increased sympathetic tone, either exercise or emotional stress. The mainstay of treatment is beta blockers at maximum tolerated doses to reduce the sympathetic input. An ICD is recommended if difficult to control symptoms or cardiac arrest survivors. Acquired long QT syndrome can be caused by drugs, electrolyte disturbance, anorexia nervosa, or severe neurological injury. These drugs block potassium channels in the heart, which regulate repolarization and prolong the QT interval. Interestingly, not all drugs that slow repolarization are arrhythm arrhythmogenic. Sevoflurin is an example of a drug that prolongs QT but is not tosatogenic. It is not the prolonged QT that 
predisposes to ventricular arrhythmias, but a prolonged TPE, which is the time from peak of T wave to the end. So only drugs that prolong this cause to size decline. Here is a list of medications that prolong QT and cause to size decline. I don't suggest you learn them all, but know which classes to be aware of. Here is a table about the safety of anesthesia drugs and long QT syndrome from a 2018 BJA review article included in the references. The things to remember is drugs to avoid as they have been shown to significantly prolong QT or increase risk of tussars to point. Spinal anesthesia over level T10 is controversial as in one study it was shown to significantly increase QT and another study was shown to have no effect so I classify this as excise caution. Interestingly, all of the antiemetic drugs we use have potential to increase the QT, but at low doses we use have minimal effect on the QT, and we need to use something to treat nausea. One of the confusing things about managing long QT under anesthesia is the difference between congenital and acquired long QT. Bradycardia is bad in acquired long QT, so isoprenaline can be used to increase heart rate and shorten the QT interval and reduce the risk of tussides to point. However, in congenital long QT, beta blockers are the mainstay of treatment and beta agonists are relatively contraindicated because their adrenic effect can promote to size to point. So the main things I think you should take away from this podcast is an alternative approach to investigations which focuses on what you're looking for, what the abnormality is and what it means for the patient. Also having an approach to long QT that focuses on avoiding prolonging QT, avoiding increased sympathetic drive, and detecting and managing torsades if it occurs at pre-op, intra-op, and post-op stages. This approach can be used broadly for any patient with a potential malignant arrhythmia, including trifascicular block, Wolf-Parkinson-White, history of ventricular tachycardia, or even atrial fibrillation. This approach can be adapted as reducing the factors that increase the likelihood of arrhythmia, avoid specific stimulus of arrhythmia, early detection of rhythm when it occurs, and management of the rhythm when it occurs. Interestingly, not all drugs that slow repolarization are arrhythmogenic. Sevoflurin is an example of a drug that prolongs QT but is not. Thanks for listening. Here are the references that this podcast is based on, a CKIP article and a BGA review article that can be easily found using Google. I'd appreciate any comments of how this could be made more useful and any ideas of what will be useful for future, future podcasts. Please leave these in the comments and subscribe for future videos.